Welcome back. Today I want to continue this lecture. If I left off by saying that, by the way, Kant, one of the leading German Enlightenment philosophers, um, not succeed in his attempt to find definite criteria or absolute an absolute standard of justice either in nature or in God. Because after all, the whole point of the enlightenment had been to free humanity, to free human thought from being caged in by these determinations and by people who might make claims on that basis. Nevertheless, if all that you have is human subjectivity, Kant believed that you nevertheless could come up with a valid concept of justice based on that very subjectivity. And this is what you know as the golden rule or what Kant calls the categorical imperative, where the standard of how you treat somebody is precisely how you yourself would want to be treated or precisely, you know, that you want to act in a fashion that if it were generalized and if everybody did it that way, you could recognize it as just. So that to Kant proves the possibility that a universal moral principle can be founded on subjectivity, even though Clearly, the human mind, subjectivity, is given to arbitrariness. It follows all kinds of purposes, interests, passions, drives, and whatnot, um, if left to its own devices. But that is not necessarily to say that it's random or you know can recognize that it needs to follow specific sets of, of, of conduct. Anyway, so modern law, as we move historically from the law that was accumulated over the centuries, precedent, especially in these European societies that had mostly feudal influence, um, while there is Roman law as a set of rules that come along as universal, applicable to all in any conceivable situation and especially derived from first principles. Uh, to many, that looks like a great enlightenment alternative to the obviously arbitrary state, state and class and nobility biased set of laws that you get out of common law or Germanic law. So modern jurisprudence um, moves further away from Kant in that, for the most part, jurists these days will say that the content of laws is irrelevant, at least for the question of justice. What matters is the procedural aspect, that there are laws that exist and are known, that the process of the creation of these laws um, was just. For instance, that it was based on sovereignty, the consent of the governed, and that they are applied uh, in a way that is consistent with the rule of law, meaning that in any given situation where you encounter somebody who's saying, I'm laying down the law, it is not the arbitrary will of that individual, but the law itself that speaks to that, through that person. It is, in other words, a government of laws and not of men. So at least in theory, whether or not the cop had a bad day or doesn't like your type should not factor into. Um, but even if that were the case, if you imagine a situation where you really have a perfectly disinterested um, set of servants of the state, like Beamte in Germany, which is what cops there are, lifetime tenured civil servants, um, who managed to look past their prejudices 
this still would not address arbitrariness that enters the process at the point of the lawmaking. So if lawmakers approach this process of um, enacting laws in a way that targets specific groups, that excludes others, and so forth, if it really is just about the procedural aspect, that there was a vote in the parliament, that the parliament was elected legitimately, and so forth, there really isn't much we can do on that basis to say, well, this is unjust. Um, again, you might ask, what about the denial of medical care to transgender people? What about the legislation that um, denies access to health care for women or that allows the harassment of LGBTQ individuals or denying them opportunities? So these are laws that we might want to call unjust, but if we're just simply going with the standards of this procedural approach, we're not, we're not really working with much. And in fact, if you go back to Kant, the possibility of specifically determining what is just was already lost because um, he can't say that. He can just say um, the individual has to come to recognize it as such, or you know, the community must accept that it came into being in a way that is just. But really, it is always merely a formal determination. There's never any way from within that system of thought where you can say the way you're denying this person access to this healthcare procedure is discriminatory and just. So with Hegel, who starts out his approach to state government and law in the philosophy of right, we do in fact have an enlightenment rooted uh, thinker that addresses the shortcoming of the liberal standard theory. Because Hegel said, and argues, as we will see, that it is possible to obtain absolute standards of justice and that you can get there without relying on saying, but nature wants us to do this or God wants us to do it, but instead by going back to reason, which is a faculty of the subjective human. And nevertheless, it is not, you know, it is the subjective human purged from the arbitrary ideal, uh, focused on what is generalizable and what is uh, universal. So there are others who also try to find more binding standards of justice, but again, they go about it in a more procedural way, like John Rawls, who is saying that if you can imagine a state of things where nobody has an interest, like a self-interest, and everybody gets together, and all these people confer, and they come up with a set of rules that they find would be just, then you have your universally just laws. Or Jürgen Habermas, who is a student of Adorno's and Horkheimer's, who says that what is needed is a similar process of domination-free discourse, which he actually finds in perhaps you know, tainted form, but nevertheless, in that intermediate stratum of a bourgeois society that it, where it's neither society proper, which is governed by economic self-interest, family life, and other sort of more grounded aspects, nor associated with the state, which is very much abstract and connected with the pursuit of the common good and general principles. But in between them, neither this nor that. You have civil society, a public sphere, places like universities and other intellectual centers, libraries, bars, and coffee houses, wherever people get together to shoot the breeze and discuss ideas. Um, the press, of course. So all this stuff are sports clubs, you know, unions, anything that is this, uh, this intermediate place where you may not get actual domination free discourse, but you get as close as you can from being not wrapped up in either immediate self-interest in society or in the, in the abstract realms of the state. 
But what Habermas reminds us, and Rawls also, is, of course, that that imaginary world where we get together without interest and without wanting to exercise power, but we do not want to use laws to achieve something, to gain something that doesn't exist. And as Hegel might point out, um, the reason there are laws is precisely because that state doesn't exist. The laws are always applicable by what they address. They address real conflicts and the way that people work through them and uh, act on them. So if, no, if nobody had ever been murdered, there wouldn't be a law against murder. The only reason that there is a law against murder is because it's a thing. And it's a thing because people, for various reasons, come to the conclusion that they want somebody else dead because they are, they see them as somebody um, antithetical to them. So how do we get to the prohibition of murder, for instance? Um, to this interest-free discourse or to the um, imaginary state of, you know, of domination-free discourse. Not, not really doable. So you have to go back to finding out what is the substance of the laws and simply read them with that in mind and say, well, there's probably something there as this is the result of a long process of human development that speaks to universal issues. So we can pretend all day long that this specific set of laws is on the books and considered to be fundamental by most people and pretend it's still just abstract, but it isn't abstract. These are the concrete laws by which people live. And there may be something wrong with them, but they didn't come into place in an abstract context and they won't be changed in an abstract uh, context, context. So let's look how they came to be, what purpose they serve, and to what extent they are rational. What is rational about them? And then this is the part where Hegel has this criterion of criticism that sounds like an affirmation of all that exists. Like an, it sounds like an uncritical affirmation. Um, we saw this formulation of this in the philosophy of history. All that exists, uh, what did he say there? Um, all that exists, exists for a good reason or something along those lines. So in the philosophy of right, we read, um, what is rational is real, and what is real is rational. That sounds like he's saying it's all good. There's nothing to see here. No, what he's saying is only that which is rational will be is considered can be considered to be real. It is real in the sense of me, of not just merely existing. It has it is it exists and it has substance. It is something that is not just a mere phenomenon, but it exists like for a deeper good purpose. So it's a critical angle to say, this is not a real thing because it doesn't hold up to my criterion of reason. Um, it can't explain itself fully with reason. So therefore it is not real. Um, it merely exists and it doesn't concern me. It is not part of the rational world or of a world that is governed by reason, as it's an innermost principle. So, and that is a back and forth process where you want to test um, what things in the world, what laws and institutions and forms of government deserve to be called real and rational. But once you've done that, you come to realize that indeed, yes, that which is rational is real and that which is real is rational. So the things in the world that are rational are the things in the world that we accept as having reality, and everything else is mere accident. Um, now, my main goal here is to argue against post-structuralism or post-modernism in its various forms. It should, logically speaking, reject any concept of justice, along with any concept of truth. Both as mere constructs should be meaningless. As a matter of fact, however, the adherents of the applicant, those who apply post structuralism in their politics and um, academic work, do employ the term justice frequently, often in the capital letter combination of social justice. So 
But is the difference here? Previous notions of justice assumed universality. Um, even with Aristotle, who has that distributive justice angle that is, um, you know, that takes into account different needs and capabilities and so forth. Nevertheless, if, say, you, you agree that somebody who works in a quarry needs to eat more bread and is entitled to more food than somebody who works in a library, you still have the equality aspect in there because everybody who works in that quarry probably should be entitled to the same amount of bread. Um, so there is, of course, this is not a complete rejection of equal standards. It is just equal standards plus a sensible recognition of difference. But in post-structuralism, you increasingly get the notion that justice means to accept without questioning or to recognize claims by different groups. By claims, I mean, like I said before, what is owed to a group, um, what they can legitimately ask for, what they should have. So in principle, there is a complete even playing field between the claims of women, people of color, native peoples, white men, business executives, and so on and so forth. Um, all claims are, in principle, in theory, equal. Now, there is no common ground. These are all different claims, and justice might mean for one group to be able to inhabit once more that land which was stolen from our ancestors by this other group of people. And therefore, these business executives should compensate us for the land that they took and give it back. This would be one example. And then the business executives might argue that by property law, by property rights, that land is theirs and there is no legal standing for this. So then the question becomes, you have two competing claims to the same thing, two different concepts of justice. Is there a common ground? No, there isn't, because there is no universal truth and there is no universal justice. Um, the claims to the validity of statements or the justification of interests all exist as incomparable and incapable of mediation. They all stand next to each other. So how do you do justice? you would recognize, first of all, that all these different claims are incommensurable. They cannot be reduced to a common denominator. What does that tell us about the ability of two competing or contradictory interests or claims to, lay, to both lay claim to the mutually exclusive validity of those claims, let alone to prevail against the other, um, it doesn't tell us anything. There is nothing in that system that would resolve and would allow to resolve. So if you are going to, if you we're going to have a postmodern court system, all a judge could do could say, yes, I hear you, I see you. You both have claims. That is very much legitimate. And um, now let's go to lunch. So what actually follows, but of course that is not how it happens. You know, you, this is the theory, what follows of, of this in practice, post-structuralists and adherents of that know exactly whose claims are superior to what other claims. <clears throat> Except again, if you try to um, make, make them, try to make them commit to spelling out what that is, that founds that um, preference over one claim, as opposed to another, um, you usually encounter a lot of evasion, like the pudding I mentioned. So um, I am suspicious of the basic approach of post-structuralism precisely because there is a concept of justice here and it doesn't um, engage with the question to what extent human thought is arbitrary and relative or rather whether it can and must arrive a determinate and true statement. Um, it simply decides it doesn't need to know. There's groups that make, make claims and that's that. 
But in the same fashion that a concept of truth sets boundaries to the arbitrariness of human thought. In other words, we can't just make up concepts. We want to speak in a way that makes sense. So the concept of justice sets boundaries to the arbitrariness of human action. So if you don't want somebody to come and pick you up in the dead of night and, and send you to a labor camp, to use the usual example, or if you do not want a um, police officer to shoot you because they thought that the hot dog you were holding was a gun and you happen to be black, um, that is exactly where you need the arbitrariness of human action to be limited. Um, and that would constitute justice. So these boundaries, who is going to set those boundaries? Um, they can't really be external ones that are imposed by a higher power. Um, what? How quickly can God draw his gun in that situation? You know, um, How is nature going to intervene short of having an anvil drop from the sky, like in the cartoons? What is the state going to do but put up um, a, a relatively weak system of sanctions against such action. So um, anything that relies on a higher power, whether imaginary or real, um, is going to be just as good as the ability and willingness of individuals to follow through and be held to account. So um, if we can say that any boundaries we want and we do want them on the arbitrariness of thought and action of humans are substantial. We would look, we would need to look for a substance within the human mind and the human subject that can enforce them, that can guarantee them. And reason, um, in the broadest sense, would give us such a concept. Because if somebody recognizes that as a valid concept, as something that allows us both to have a a critical criterion of the world and an understanding of and an ethical obligation and appreciation of the world, um, while we also recognize the categorical imperative, which is to say we recognize in all other individuals that they likewise are reason-endowed creatures, then we might have something to work with. So, um, but that requires, of course, uh, accepting that there is a determinate concept of truth in the first place, that reason can arrive at, and that humans are capable of, of, of recognizing in the world. And then on that basis, you can build a concept of justice. So post-structuralism abandons reason in the first place. The consequences that had is uh, stuff I discussed earlier. But one is that now you are left to rely on the indeterminacy and arbitrariness of human notions and actions. At the same time as the arbitrariness, the randomness uh, that no longer requires any justification is perpetually uh, overdetermined by this language change, where everything is scrutinized for whether it uh, whether the language constitutes a power structure, perpetuates it, um, or challenges. So all interest of differences of power um, or conflict plays out or is, is negotiated only in the realm of language, only in the way people talk about things, which really doesn't do a thing about actual life, about social and economic or political power. Um, the closer you get to having to criticize specific action as unjust, uh, or specific, more importantly, specific, specific ideas as false, the less you're going to get concrete answers from post-structuralists. Um, what you do get, however, is repetitions on the theme, and I've criticized this before, of you need to see the other side's point of view. If you recognize my reality, then perhaps you would realize that you can't discriminate it. I pointed out before that the people who, in situations where they were fighting back against um, discrimination at the school board level, for instance, um, in most recent examples, were not well served by that approach um, because it does not compel anyone to say, oh, yes, that's true. I do owe you recognition. No, 
if you're dealing with somebody who is saying, I don't think you have a legitimate existence, or you're very, you know, your very identity is my problem, and I don't think you have these rights, then what are you? Um, so you need a theory that can conceptualize this real conflict that you have with the person in the audience on the school board um, who has that view of you. At what point um, do you stop relying on the attempt to, you know, to, to plead for your humanity and recognize there's something else that you might need to do? So if you actually want a concept of justice that has teeth, what you would need is one that has the duty or that gives us the duty to reconcile competing interests, which can also entail telling specific interests that are articulated um, that we don't consider them valid. That is entirely possible. Um, but there is no way for competing interests to gain recognition except, like in post-structuralism there isn't, except to win at a game of discourse. And it is through this language play uh, that you win, which is a way of exercising power over the definitions and that you enforce the validity of one definition over another. So again, um, in the end, you might say, yes, you have the right as a professor to ask your students to use pronouns, regardless of the death threats that you receive and the and the day-long special on Fox News and Breitbart and wherever else um, that they gave you on that occasion. Usually it comes with that recognition, however, that yes, of course, these people also have a right as a matter of free speech to threaten your life, which is a curious position to take. Um, but it makes perfect sense if all you see is discourse that is floating and has no, no real consequence except that people who don't believe the way that, you know, in the mutual recognition of all different views must be forced to recognize. So in that sense, Ibrahim Kendi's idea for a federal agency for anti-racism that would enforce recognition in language of difference and the validity of different points of view is exactly the um, rotten fruit of this approach. Um, so then what is the point of post-structuralism if it so clearly has not actually done the job it sets out and purports to do, namely to make sure that historically long discriminated and oppressed groups, women, people of color, native people, et cetera, et cetera, gain recognition, gain resources, attain justice, attain an equal standing for them. None of that has been achieved in any practical sense. All that has happened is to create the inclusion of some people from these groups in higher strata of um, an increasingly stratified economic order on a job market where you have a professional class that is shrinking and that is fighting over resources. There you had the inclusion of visible representatives. Hence the, um, the slogan, representation matters. Yes, sure, representation matters. But what matters to you as a Black woman, say as a Black transgender woman, um, who did not get hired as the head of a nonprofit organization, that wants to amplify the voices of people like you, you still have to pay rent and you're not going to be able to. And that is true of 99.9% .9 of other people like you who were not just hired to chair an organization meant to increase your representation. So what if post-structuralist politics, if homo politics is so useless and toothless for its actual stated purpose is its real purpose. Um, it amounts to, I can tell you what its function is, it amounts to a justification of raw competition, although displaced into the realm of language. The winner 
takes the spoils of a language game where if you can get away with claiming this or that, good for you. And in that sense, it is the philosophical reflex of a neoliberal economic order characterized by a social Darwinist struggle for survival, nowhere more fiercely than among that professional managerial class. So there, um, it offers instructions for how to sharpen the knives uh, and where to put them if you're trying to gain the symbolic capital that will lead you to recognition as somebody who is the most effective in amplifying the voices of the margin. Um, that's all it does. When you really, re when you boil it down with effect, that's what it is. Um, as a philosophical system, it is starting with Foucault, reheated reactionary garbage, and as something to serve historically oppressed populations. Um, it also is not really good for any. So this ends the lecture part, and now we can do a discussion. I am going to end the recording, though, in case you don't want to end up on